morning, everybody. Welcome back. So today, we're going to finish talking about errors and exceptions, which is important and useful. And then we're going to start a topic that's going to uh, really kind of bring us to at least the end of the part of the semester that you're going to be tested on, which is hashing and maps. So we'll start talking about that today, and I think we'll probably need Monday to wrap up that topic. Next week, just to sort of brief you a little bit on what's happening. So you have one more quiz in the CBTF next week. That quiz will cover exceptions and uh, maps and hashing. So that quiz will really cover material up through Monday. That's our last quiz. Immediately following that quiz, I think starting on Friday, we will have the final midterm. So that midterm is earlier than it would normally be. Normally it would just be another quiz. It would be the next week. But the CBTF scheduled that one earlier. I'm happy about that. That means you'll be done with it several days before the final project fair, and at least a day or two before you have to demo your final project in lab for grading. So essentially, the last thing you will do in this class will be your final project. But we will have two CBTF assessments next week relatively close together. The first one, again, will be on maps and hashing and exceptions. The second one will be the third midterm, midterm two, that will cover the last third of content from the class, but really kind of, you know, anything at that point is fair game. So you may see bits of imperative programming, you may see some object-oriented stuff. Part of what we're trying to do on the homework problems for the next week is get you ready for that. So yesterday's problem, which people seem to enjoy, um, was on some level about exceptions, but it was also had some object-oriented pieces in it, and that was intentional, because we're reminding you about, you know, how do I store the strings so I can use it in fault, right? Well, you know, that was a good reminder about how to do that. These are things you guys have hopefully picked up by now. Okay, so let's finish up talking about exceptions. So on Wednesday, we pointed out that in Java, there are three real different types of throwable objects. There are these uh, checked exceptions, which I have to uh, declare that I'm going to throw, and I have to handle these explicitly. If I don't, the compiler will complain and my code won't compile. These are for cases where I know that there's a possibility that something could go wrong, and you are now required to plan for that possibility. And these are normally things that are outside of your control. They're kind of in the environment surrounding your program. They're not a mistake that you made as a programmer. They're an unexpected condition that could occur that you are responsible for dealing with. The second category of exceptions in Java are these unchecked exceptions. These, you don't have to declare that you throw. You don't have to explicitly handle, although you can. And the reason for that is these are normally the result of mistakes that you made. You walked off the end of an array. You dereferenced um, a reference that was null. Um, you've tried to downcast something incorrectly, whatever. Uh, these, are pro these are the result of programmer error. And so, again, you don't declare that you would throw these because if you knew that, you would fix it. And then the final category that we just briefly touched on, I won't spend too much time talking about, are errors. And these are cases where the Java runtime that's running your bytecode has actually encountered some kind of serious problem that prevents it from moving forward. So you've run out of memory, you've overflowed the stack, whatever. These frequently are still your fault because your program has done something that, you know, again, you have used too much memory. You have uh, recursed too deeply. So usually there's a problem with your program that you can fix to prevent these. Um, the reason that they're a separate category here is partly because at normally at this point there's nothing to do. There's no way to handle these. Uh, you know, your program's about to crash. Okay. So let's talk about what to do about the each, each kind of exception. How are we going to actually handle these? So errors, as I was just pointing out, there's really nothing to do at that point. Once you've run out of memory, you know, it's kind of, the world is kind of over at that point. There's nothing the interpreter can do. It's just going to stop and crash. Um, so there's not much you can do here except write better code, um, which is also the strategy for dealing with unchecked exceptions. These are your fault. The way to, to avoid them is to fix the problem. Unfortunately, again, Java is an older language. And as a result, 
it doesn't do as good a job of checking for these kind of things as you might want. We talked earlier in the semester about one of the goals of modern programming language design being to move exceptions and errors from happening when the program runs to being caught when it's compiled, because at that point, it's much more likely that you can fix them. Your app hasn't crashed when a user is actually trying to use it. Your new uh, server or a new program that you've sold to a client isn't crashing on site for them, and they're not on the phone with you yelling at you, right? You caught it when you compiled your code. Newer languages do a better job of this, right? Uh, particularly things like no pointer exceptions and some of these other problems. They do more analysis on your code when the code's actually compiled to try to identify these problems, warn you about them, and force you to fix them then so they don't bite you later. Checked exceptions, you know, again, a lot of handling these really depends on where your program is and what it's trying to do. With the apps that you guys are uh, working with for your final project, um, you know, l let me just warn you about something. So when, when you demo something, you know, let's say you're at a, a hackathon or you're at a project fair for a class and somebody from, you know, Google or Microsoft or Facebook or Instagram or whatever company it is you want to work for, you know, the latest new Silicon Valley startup walks up and you're like, hey, check out my new cool app. Do you know one of the things that we're always tempted to do? I've, I've been in that position before. Somebody has shown you your app. They're like, hey, check it out. What do you think that person wants to do? See if they can break it. Yeah, exactly. It's like, ooh, cool. Let's see what happens if I, you know, click all the buttons at once, right? Or rotate the screen a bunch of times really quickly. Or, you know, you're, you're asking for a number. What if I put some letters into that field? Yeah, I don't know. It's just some tendency that computer scientists have where it's like, I know what you want me to do, but what happens if I don't do that? Um, and users are like this, right? Um, normal users are probably not trying to break your app just, you know, uh, for fun, but they may still enter incorrect input and things like that. So these are things you need to handle and think about what to do about. Java's good about warning you in these cases where, an, a, you know, a checked exception could be thrown that you need to handle. The right thing to do is not to just wrap it in a try-catch block and ignore it. There's usually something you have to do because something is about to go wrong or something has gone wrong and you need to act appropriately. Uh, be happy, if you guys run into these sorts of things on your final project, we'll be happy to talk about it with you and, and suggest some strategies for, for addressing the problem. One of the other objectives of yesterday's homework problem was to point out to you that Java exceptions are just objects. They're just another type of Java object. And you can work with them like Java objects. So like Java objects, they have some useful features. For example, they can be printed. You can pass them to system.out.println or to log in Android. Or you can extract a string from them this way, and that will give you a little bit of information. Sometimes a line number, sometimes a little bit of information about, you know, what happened. Sometimes enough to fix the problem. Uh, there's a method called get message, which pulls just, you know, a little bit of a shorter uh, piece of information about that uh, particular exception. And then there's also a really useful function, which will actually print a stack trace for you. So when you guys have seen errors and problems when you've been working in IntelliJ, that's what's being shown, is not just where the error happened, but the entire series of function calls that got you to that point. And that can be really useful context for figuring out how to fix the problem. All right, so, so, and, and this is, throwable is the class in Java that essentially can be passed to throw. So in Java, you can throw anything that's throwable. That's either a throwable or inherits from throwable, you can see that there are two direct classes that inherit from throwable. One are errors, which we talked about. Those are those problems that the interpreter can run into. Um, and then the second one are exceptions. And those include both the checked exceptions um, and the unchecked exceptions. Okay. Well, actually, I think I had this up here because I wanted to show you what some of the, some of the methods are, right? So I've got get message, I've got get stack trace, um, I've got print stack trace, I have two string, right? These are these are um, features that all exceptions have. All right, so, you know, and, and then we talked a little bit about sort of um, exceptional code flow. I think that's why this is here, right? Just thinking about where exceptions propagate. I'm not sure exactly why this is what the slide is doing. Okay. 
So the other thing you can do with exceptions, so we, up, up until this point, we've talked about handling exceptions. But when you start to write more sophisticated Java code, you may want to throw exceptions. There are times and places where throwing an exception is the right thing to do. That's sort of how we motivated this whole topic, remember? Because we had come across several cases when we were working with simple, our little simple programs, where it was like, I don't know what to do in this case. You know, somebody passed a bad argument to my constructor. The constructor can't return null, it has to return an object. And so what do I do? So throwing exception. So sometimes one thing you can do with an exception and a catch block is you can actually re-throw it. So here's an example. Um, let's say that I don't, you know, so we talked last time about like, what do I do if there's a, you know, with this URI syntax exception? Somehow I'm trying to create a URI with a bad string. What do I do in that case? Well, maybe I can pop up a message and warn the user. Uh, maybe I want to log it, but maybe I do want to crash because maybe I want to know about this and, and this is something that's broken about my app. So I want to make sure I don't ignore it. So here's what I'm doing in my catch block. I'm logging it using some Android log syntax. So it's in the logs now. Now I'll know that this happened, and I'm logging it with the um, log.e uh, command, which logs it as an error. And then I'm gonna throw it. I'm throwing it out of my catch block. So this is a, you know, a, a fairly common pattern in certain cases where I don't know how to handle the exception, but I still wanna know what happened. So I record some information, I have a log message now that makes sure that I know what happened, and then I rethrow it, right? That means that this, this uh, function declaration is also incorrect, because I would have to declare that this function now throws that exception as well. So this is something I can do on the exception handling path. I can also throw my own exceptions. And again, there are some cases in Java where this is incredibly useful. So we talked last time about if I have this string storage class that I'm using to store some strings for whatever reason, and if you try to initialize it with a, with a negative or with a zero size, then I can use this type of syntax to throw an exception to the caller to make sure that they know not to do this. And the right thing to do here, as you guys practiced yesterday, is throw an unchecked exception that's called a legal argument exception. There's also an invalid parameter exception as well that you can use. It's an unchecked exception. Why is it an unchecked exception? Because it is a programmer error to initialize a string storage object with a zero or negative size. That's not your fault. You're trying to do the right thing. That's the fault of whoever used your class, right, whoever called this. So, you know, again, this is, this is an example before we really didn't have a good way of sort of dealing with this particular case. But now what we can do is we can say, if you try to initialize a string storage with a negative value, I'm gonna do what I, what you guys did yesterday in a similar situation, and I'm just gonna do throw new legal argument exception, and I'll say something like string storage size must be positive. There you go. And that's what's gonna happen when somebody tries to compile and run this program, which is exactly what I want to happen. Notice here that I didn't have to declare that my constructor threw this exception, why not? Why don't I have to declare, I mean, normally if I throw certain kinds of exceptions, I have to declare the function is going to throw an exception. I don't have to do that here, why not? Good potential quiz question. Yeah. What's that? I can still declare it on a constructor. Constructors still have to declare if they're gonna throw a checked exception. So why don't I have to do that here? I just gave away the answer, yeah. It's not a checked exception, this is an unchecked exception. A legal argument, unchecked exception. No pointer exceptions, unchecked. So I can throw them without declaring that I'm gonna do that. And someone can call this constructor and create, so down here, same thing, I'm allowed to create a new instance of string storage without wrapping that in a try catch. The reason for that is, again, unchecked exceptions are the result of programmer error. It's my fault for trying to create a string storage object with a negative size, right? And so the right thing to do here is not to wrap it and handle it, it's to fix my code so I make sure that I call it with, you know, a, a not positive non-zero size. So you guys have already done this. 
you know, I don't know why this, I'm, I'm talking about this now, this is how we throw exceptions in Java, we use a throw keyword. It's one of the last keywords that we're gonna see together this semester. I think we've done all of them. Um, last little bit of special Java syntax, throw. I can throw anything that's throwable. Anything that inherits is a throwable object or inherits from throwable, and I can also catch anything that's throwable. So if you're going to throw an exception, here are some guidelines about how to do that. The first thing is, look around for an existing exception class that's a good fit for what you're trying to do. You can declare your own exception classes. They're just Java objects. So for example, if you have a special type of a legal argument exception, you could declare a class in Java that, de that extends a legal argument exception and overrides some of its methods to provide some of your own functionality. You rarely need to do that until you're writing fairly specialized code. Normally, there's an e existing exception. There's lots of different types of uh, Java exceptions that are out there already. Frequently, there's an existing exception that you can use. But you can also, like I said, create your own. You can override exception, and then you can throw this. Um, and inside my class definition, I'm also over allowed to do things like override the various methods that that exception provides. So I can customize the message, I can provide additional information, whatever. All right, finally, talking about exceptions, it's a good way to finish. So Java also supports, and this is, pr this is actually pretty useful in a lot of cases, something called a finally block. Finally, as you might uh, expect, is executed after either the try or the catch completes. So the, the code inside a finally block is always run, always. That includes if either the catch or the try returns. So this is weird. Even if I return out of a try block, the finally block is still going to run. All right, so in this case, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna uh, call start. I'm gonna run something that could generate an error. If it does, I'm gonna jump to the catch block and then into the finally block. If it doesn't, I'm gonna complete the try block and then jump to the finally block. So this is really useful in certain cases if you have logic that needs to run if either, regardless of whether an exception occurred or not. So you're doing some work, maybe you need to like clean up something you did before you started this part of your code, and you know that that finally block's gonna run regardless of whether or not there's an exception. So here's an example of this. I have a little function here that errors half the time. It calls random.nextBoolean. If that's true, I'm gonna generate a null pointer exception. If it's false, I don't do anything. Um, in this case, it looked like I generated an exception. Let's run it again. In that case, I didn't. But the finally block always runs. And I think. Oh, last thing. So this is actually pretty, pretty important. Um, so one of the things you can do with try, and this is a, a programming pattern that we don't really have enough time to give you guys some practice with. I just want to point this out, because this may come in handy is if, if you find yourself using certain um, functions and doing a lot of error checking along the way, you can potentially wrap all of that in a single try-catch block and just let it fail if something's broken. One of the places that you'll see this, if you guys are working with JSON as part of your final project. So when you're working with JSON, you're going to have cases where it's like, you know, I need to, grab one key and follow that to another key and follow that to another key and follow it to another key. And if you don't use this strategy, what you're gonna have happen, hey guys, excuse me, can we? Yeah, thanks. I can, I can hear you up here, that's why. All right, so here's an example of doing this without a try-catch block, right? I've got a JSON parser, and now what I'm doing is I'm going key by key by key, right? I look for a metadata key. If I don't have that, I return. And then I'm gonna peel off the next key from my JSON object, right? Uh, and then I'm gonna look for a key called width. And if I don't have that, I return, right? And this is really tedious. Maybe some of you have already started to have to write code like this, right? Here's a much cleaner way to do this, right? Which is I've wrapped it all in a single try-catch block. And now I'm just chaining all of these calls together. So I create my JSON parser, I parse some JSON that's in a string, and then I get it as a JSON object, I grab the metadata field as a JSON object, I grab the width um, 
the width field of that JSON object, and I get it as an int. Now, this will fail if the JSON object that I'm trying to parse doesn't have a metadata field, or if that metadata field isn't a JSON object, and if that metadata field as a JSON object doesn't have a key called width, and if that key called width doesn't contain something that can be converted into an int. So this will only work if my JSON has the structure that I'm expecting. But if it doesn't, then it's broken anyway, so who cares? So in this way, essentially, I'm saying, you know, this will work if the JSON has the structure that I expect, and if it doesn't, it could fail anywhere in here, but who cares? I don't care if it fails at line five or line six or line seven. Um, I just want it to, I just think it's going to work, because I've looked at the structure in the JSON, and I think this is the right way to do it, right? If I get back bad JSON, this is going to fail, um, but I don't have to check for the failure at every step. I can just wrap this all together, put it inside a try-catch block, and deal with the result if any of the things fail. So this is often a good strategy. Again, look at how, you know, if you look at this and how ugly it is, I've got like little bit after little bit after little bit, and it's really repetitive. Whereas here, it's really, really nice. Right, it's all chained together, you know, very intuitive. All right, I think at this point, we are done with exceptions. Any questions about exceptions or errors? Yeah. Yeah, so you can, so the question was, if I wanted to break this up, do I need to write try, could I put each step inside a try-catch block? Yeah, you can, right? So I could do something that looks like this, but I could, instead of checking here to see if info has metadata, I could just put some of these things in try-catch block. It's still, you still end up with the same sort of repetitive, very verbose code. So it's, I mean, one way to think about this is that if any of the steps in this JSON parsing chain fail, then I'm gonna do the same thing. So I might as well do them all at once under one try-catch block. If any of them fail, then there's something wrong with the JSON and I can't get the piece of information I was looking for. Usually I don't expect that to happen. Usually, you know, again, I study the structure of the JSON that's being returned by the API that I'm using and I know that this is going to work. Um, Maybe it doesn't work until I get, you know, everything in the right order and I get all the fields properly parsed and everything. But once it works, it works 99.99% of the time. From time to time, I get back some malformed JSON and I hit my, I hit the catch block and then I have to figure out what to do, right? How do I result here? Maybe I just ignore this piece of data. Maybe I throw an, show an error message, whatever. Maybe I retry. Maybe I just go back to the API and ask it for data again and that was just a one-time failure and the next time I get something that works. Good question. Other questions about exceptions? In the back, yeah. Say that one more time. Yeah, so I think, I think the, the general question is, what happens to exceptions generated inside a catch block, right? So, so those end up e e essentially emerging from the entire statement, right? I can have a tr I can have a try catch inside my catch block, right? What what's not going to happen is they're not going to be caught by the other catch blocks below it, right? That's not how the try catch statement works, right? So if I if my catch block generates an exception, it's essentially going to jump out of the try catch statement, right? If that try catch statement ins is inside another try catch statement, it might be caught somewhere else. Yeah, it's a good question because you can have cases where your catch block is gonna generate, generate its own exceptions. Other questions? Good question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let's, let's look at how return statements work in try catch blocks. Where's my final example? Here it is. So, so the question is, does, well, it's not gonna allow me to return here. Let me wrap this in another function. So if I imagine I'm wrapping this now in another function so that I can return. Make sure this works, good. 
It's nothing special, right? If I get to the return statement, the function will return, right? Except, this is interesting. I gotta get it to, to fail for me. There we go. See this? So that's kind of interesting. Again, the finally statement always, always, always gets executed, even if I return. So what happened here? I called falter, could error, did not generate an error. I printed done, I return, but before I return, I do run the final block. Yeah. If I return inside a try and I haven't seen an error by that point, I'm done, right? If I see an error before the return statement, I jump it to the catch block. Yeah, great question. That's, that's actually a really interesting question. Let's find out. Let's see which one of these is actually going to get executed. So now let's print the result of this. Ah, oh, it, okay, it's mad at me. I need to know the return statement. So it looks like the return statement inside the finally block actually overrides the value. I did not know that. That is interesting. I mean, a way to think about it is simply that the code inside the finally block runs after the try catch statement always, right? <laughs> so essentially my try catch, um, my try statement was returning one, and then I ran the code inside my finally block. I can't stop the function from returning at that point. There's no unreturn, right? But I can return a different value. Does that make sense? That is a little strange. Other questions? Exceptions, exceptional code flow. All right, so let's go on. So this is, what we're gonna talk about from now through Monday is, is fun stuff. It's really cool, it brings us to a really powerful data structure that you guys get to start using. Um, and it's one of these topics that has, like, broad applicability. You have seen these before. You have not known what they were, but you have seen the result of what we're about to talk about all over the place. It's a huge part of the world of computing. It's connected to Bitcoin. It's connected to P versus NP. It's connected to maps, which are a data structure that you guys should learn how to use going forward. It is incredibly cool. So here's where we're gonna start. And you guys will go on in 225 and you'll learn more about these functions. But for now, you're just gonna have to bear with me and believe me when I tell you that I have a function that has the following properties. First property is determinism. So given the same input, it always produces the same output. It can also take an arbitrary amount of input and produce a fixed size output. So for example, I can give it the entire text of, you know, the recordings of this year's congressional session and it will produce a single integer. I can give it a smaller string, it'll produce a single integer. So fixed size output, variable size input, but also deterministic. If I give it the same input twice, I always get the same value out. So far, this is very easy to satisfy. My function could just return to zero. That gives me determinism. But I'm not done. Uniformity. So if I give it lots of different inputs, Eventually, what I find is that the output of this function is uniformly distributed across its range. So, for example, if its output is an integer, and I give it lots and lots and lots of different inputs, eventually, what I expect is to see there's an equal probability of it producing any integer from, you know, whatever the smallest integer I can produce to the largest. So every output value is equally possible. The final really, really critical step is that it's efficient to compute. So I can do this fast. And again, efficient to compute even given a large input. So I wanna be able to take a big amount of information, send it to this function, and within a reasonable amount of time, get a value out. So how we do this? Like real hash functions are incredibly sophisticated and, and mysterious. But you know, we can come up, so, so first of all, like I said before, if I just return zero, I have met the determinism property. No matter what is in this input array, 
I get the same value. And so it's deterministic. So that's good. What I'm breaking down here is that I'm not getting this uniformity, uh, property, right? So over many inputs, each output value is equally likely. So if you imagine feeding in lots of different arrays of integers, I'm only ever gonna get zero. So that's not good. So I can, I can try doing this a different way. So it's kind of tempting to do the following. I'll just, we'll, we'll explore one red heron input. Um, let's get, let's get our random library out. So I could do return random new random dot next int. And let's give this a big number. So I could just return a random integer. Um, Uh, do an example here of running this with, for now, just an empty array. Okay, so what's wrong with this? This seems better. I'm getting values that eventually are gonna be evenly distributed between zero and 1024 squared. What's wrong with this? What, what feature of my hash function that I wanted am I not getting? Not getting determinism. Exactly. If I give it the same input, you'll see I'm giving it the same input every time, and I'm getting some random number, right? So this doesn't work. All right, so I want it to be deter deterministic, uniform, and efficient. So for the sake of argument, and this is not a good hash function, right? Let's say we do the following. And we do We just do the sum of the elements in the array. So this has this nice property that it is deterministic. We're gonna get the same value every time. It's still fixed size, no matter how big the array is, I'm always gonna get back something that's int. Now integers in Java only have a fixed range, and so if I give you a really, really enormous array with big values, eventually what could happen is that it's gonna get so big then it's gonna flip around and become small again. It's gonna wrap around. That's okay, I don't care about that. I'm, I'm fine with that. Given lots and lots and lots and lots of inputs, particularly if they're random length and they get very long and they have random integer values, this will actually satisfy that uniformity property where I'll get any value out, right? Um, or, or I'll cover the range of integers. Now you might, depending on what your inputs are, I might not expect to get arrays that have millions of values that are essentially random integers. So given real numbers, like if this was filled with student IDs or temperature values, this is probably not a good hash function. Um, but this gives you some feeling of, of the properties that this function needs to possess. And again, we're not gonna look at real hash functions. But what we've just designed is a simple, primitive, and not very good version of something that's called a hash function. So I, I love the word hash. Has anyone had a hash recently? Has anyone ever eaten a hash? You can order one. You can go to a diner, I don't know, some diners around here, and get like a corned beef hash, or, uh, you know, or a brisket hash at some of the nicer restaurants. What is it? It's like stuff all chopped up together, right? That's what a hash is. That's, that's the visual I get now when I think of a hash function, right? That's what I'm doing, I'm taking this massive input, and I'm chopping it up and mixing it up into little pieces, right? So everything all gets blended together. That's what a good hash function does. So the data that's returned by a hash function, sometimes we call just a hash, the hash of an input. We call it a hash value. You'll see this called hash codes, digests sometimes. Uh, we'll see that coming up in a minute. Uh, but these are all the outputs of some type of hash function that has these properties. So I doesn't want to load that page. Okay, that's too bad. It did before. Um, the, that page was documentation about a hash function that somebody developed. So there's actually a bunch of hash functions out in the world. We'll look at some ones that get used in the real world in a minute. So this may not seem useful at first. As a hint that it could potentially be useful, one thing I want to remind you of is that there were three functions that all Java objects provide. 
to string, which we've looked at and we've used, equals, what was the other one? Hash code. There's several other ones that we're not as interested in, but those are three that we are interested in. So now we've come to the point in the semester where we're actually gonna talk about that third function that every single Java object provides, which is called hash code. That's how useful it is. But let me motivate how useful it is with some examples. So what could we do with these hash functions? Like I said, they get used all over the place. And once you start to recognize them, you're gonna see them a lot, particularly if you go on a computer science. So let me, let's, let's walk through a scenario here. So let's say that you are hosting some huge file on your computer. It's like a software package or something like that. And you let people download that file. And let's say that somebody else is trying to download that file. And again, this is a big file, 120 gigabytes, maybe not be large enough, maybe it's like half a terabyte or something like that. And I need this to install a particular piece of software. So it's possible, and this is unlikely, but it is possible that at some point I started this download and, you know, it ran for 20 minutes. It's possible that somewhere, somewhere on the internet in between me and that other computer, that that file got corrupted. It's possible that one of the numbers in that file got changed. And that can potentially cause the entire software package to not work properly. So once I've downloaded the file, what I want to know is, did I get the right file? Does the file contain the information that it should? Is my file the same as the one that's stored on your computer? You know, again, you guys do this all the time, you take this all for granted, but, you know, this is a real problem. How do I make sure that you and I have the same file? So there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, if I don't have a hash function, I really don't have very many good options here. One thing I can do is download the file again, which will take another 20 minutes. And then I can compare the two files to each other and make sure they're the same. That's, you know, that will work. It's slow. And it's wasteful. I've just downloaded the same file twice. I've used a lot of extra space on my computer to store both versions of the same file, so I don't want to do this. It's a bad, bad solution to the problem. But remember, I have this magical function that has these properties. Given the same input, it produces the same output. It can also take really large inputs and efficiently compute this small hash value. So what do I do? You compute the hash of your file, and once I've downloaded the file, I compute the hash of my file, and then we compare those two hashes. If the hashes match, then it, there's an incredibly high probability, it's not 100%, but extremely high, that I have the right version of the file. If they don't match, then it's certain that there's a bit that has been flipped or some information that's missing, right? I haven't got the correct version of the file. Oh, man, all, all these examples are not working, which is frustrating. So there is a, there's a software package that I've downloaded. Maybe I can, hold on a sec. I bet I can get this to work. going to cast, no, I don't want to cast this tab. How do I do this? Cast, desktop, share. All right, there we go. So here is, this is a software package that is used for typesetting scientific papers it's called Tech kind of awful, but people use it. Um, here is a version for Mac that you can download. Um, this is a massive file. Okay, so I'm gonna click here, it's gonna take me to another page. Let me blow this up so you guys can see it. It's a 3.2 gigabyte file. And what do I see here? I see that there's a piece of information on this web page. It says, the MD5 sum is this big, this is actually a number, it's represented in hexadecimal notation, but this is a number. This is a hash value. MD5 is a hash function. So the site that hosts this file has run MD5 on this file. And 
this is the result. The reason this is here is when I download the file, and I'm not gonna do that right now because it'll probably take a few minutes, I can then run ND5 on my own computer and confirm that these two things are the same. And I'm gonna go, well, you know what, this is fine. And here's the output of me actually doing this. So I downloaded the file, I have a program called MD5 on my computer, and I can use MD5 to compute the hash. This took, you know, a couple seconds, it's pretty fast. Here's the result. So the host, the, the, the site that's hosting the file said, expect that when you run this hash function on this data, you're going to get this value. And indeed, when I ran it, I got that hash value. So now I have high confidence that I have the right version of the file. This is one place that this gets used. This thing over here might look familiar to you. Have you guys seen these before? Something that looks like this, this long string, it's about the same length every time, of hexadecimal digits. Has anyone seen one of these? Yeah. Object of two string. That, that might produce, I'm not sure that Java uses MD5 as a hash function. I'm thinking about something else. Another place, if you've been doing this, yeah. No, yeah, you might see this sometimes on web address. I'm thinking about as you've developed for the class. So here's another scenario. Maybe this will start to hit home a little bit more. You sent me some document. And, you know, I deleted it because it was a Microsoft document. Uh, but let's pretend that I kept this document, did something with it. Um, and at some point, oh, at some point, you're like, wait, I don't know what version of the document you had. I think I made some changes to it, and you don't have the latest version. Right? So without a hash function, what do I have to do? Well, you can send me the file again. Or you could sit there and write me an email describing all the contents of the file, and I could manually look through it to make sure I had all of your changes. Um, and I'm gonna, you know, again, this is still a doc, my Microsoft file, so I'm still gonna delete it. But remember, I have this magical function. I have a hash function that I can run on this file. So instead of you, you know, us doing this really manual process of, we could sit down next to each other computers and go through and make sure that the two versions of the file are the same. I've seen people do stuff like this, but I have a hash function. So you could run the hash function on your file, and I can run it on my file. If they're the same, we know that the contents are the same. I still have the right version. If they're different, then it's possible that you've made changes that I don't have. This is the basis of a system that you guys have been using all semester. It's a system called Git. Git uses hashes to identify and fingerprint the contents of your files when you do a commit. It also uses a hash to identify the entire commit and for other purposes. So, have you guys seen this over here? If you go to github.com, See this long, it says commit, and then there's this long string. That is a hash. It's a hash of an object in Git's database that contains not only information about the files that are part of that commit, but also a timestamp and your information and other things. But internally, Git uses these, these are, this is a SHA-1 hash, I think, indeed, uh, to fingerprint everything. So when you make a change to a file, how does Git know that the file has changed? It knows because it computes a SHA-1 hash of the file, and then it looks at the version that you've committed before. If the two are the same, you haven't made any changes. If the two are different, the file is, you know, Git refers to this as dirty, right? It has new information in it, and so if you go to commit, Git's gonna include that file. So again, internally, and this is not just true for Git, there's a lot of different version control systems. I would argue pretty much every version control system is heavily reliant on the use of hashes to fingerprint content. So I take two files, if you make a small change to one of them, the hash function will be different, and so I can identify that you've modified the file. Git also uses hashes to identify the file contents. 
So here's roughly what happens when you push to github.com. This is actually not far off from the protocol. So this is a case we can talk about another internet protocol. This is the protocol that Git uses when it communicates with github.com. So when you do a push, your computer says, hey, github.com, I have the following content. I have the following files. And it sends it a bunch of hashes that identify the content in the repository. Each one of those hashes is the hash of some file. It doesn't send all of your files to GitHub. That would be insane. Doesn't need to, because I have this magical hash function. If I compute the hash of the file, I send GitHub the hash. The hash uniquely identifies the content in the file. So then what GitHub does is the server says, oh, okay, I've already got a bunch of these files. Before you sent me or your partner already pushed this file and this file and this file. So you don't need to send those again. I've got them. I have that content. But I do need um, certain files, right? So normally when you push, there are files in your repository that GitHub doesn't have yet. But I use the hashes to identify which files those are. So I don't send things over and over and over again. This is how, you know, if you push and there's no new content, it will say, you know, nothing to do, right? It doesn't send the files again. It doesn't need to, right? The server knows what it has. Your client knows what it has. And the way they identify those files is entirely using these, the output of this hash function. So again, like I said, hashes get used all over the place. They're this magical tool that we've deployed all throughout computing to serve a variety of different purposes. So you might have started to wonder up till this point, what happens if my hash function produces the same output for two inputs? Let's say I give it, you know, the first Harry Potter book and the second Harry Potter book, and it produces the same result. What happens? So this is called a collision. Uh, this, this is the terminology that we use. So this means that we have a collision. Two different inputs of the hash function that are not the same and produce the same output. Whether or not this is a problem depends a lot on what I'm trying to do with the hash function. There are places where if this happens, the universe would explode. For example, if Git ever had a case where two different files in your repository that were different actually hashed to the same value, the universe would explode. It would stop working. Git is entirely dependent on the hashes for all of the content in your repository being different. But there are other places where this is okay. Right? It really depends on how we're using the hash function. If the hash is small, then we usually expect collisions to happen and we plan for them. Once I make the hash larger and larger and larger, I can show you, and we'll go through some of the math at a very high level in a minute, that the probability that there are collision gets extremely small. And again, so small that entire systems are predicated on the fact that this would never, ever, ever happen. Okay, I'm gonna finish with a fun little paradox that we'll start with on Monday that illustrates part of the problem here. So some of you probably have heard this before. If you have, pipe down. Let other people think about it. So let's say, I don't know, there might be like 500 people here right now, but let's say in a room with 100 students, what is the probability that two of them have the same birthday? So you can think of your birthday as the output of a hash function that converts you into a number. There are 365 values. So essentially what I'm saying is, if I have a hash function that takes a, has 100 inputs and has an output space of 365, what's the probability that I have a collision? I will leave you with this, and we will come back and start here on Monday. I just have a couple of announcements. Um, you know, keep working on your final project. Really excited to see what you guys are gonna do. Uh, I have office hours today at 10 o'clock right now as usual. Um, other than that, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Get some work done on your final project. I'll see you on Monday to finish talking about hash functions. <laughs>